Hi guys! Today we're going to be going over the Holocene, aka right now. And if you're not sure what the Holocene is, I honestly don't know if anybody would actually click on this video if you didn't know what the Holocene was and want to know more about it. But if you don't, I want to show you right here. It is the last most recent epoch in the geologic time scale. We're also going to talk a little bit about the Pleistocene first, just to set up what happens in the Holocene and why, and the place Pleistocene and Holocene epochs or epochs make up the period in the geologic timescale called the Quaternary. And that started around 2.6 million years ago and goes to 0 million years ago, aka today. And then we're going to have a part two to this video talking about the Anthropocene, which is technically a epoch or epoch or age or stage after the Holocene, which is actually right now. But you can find various timescales with the Anthropocene on it and with just the Holocene as the most recent epoch on it. So it kind of varies, but we'll talk about the Anthropocene next time, which is why I'm going to gray it out now. And in today's video, we're just going to be talking about the retreat of the glaciers from the last glacial maximum, the Younger Dryas cool period, the extinction of large mammals, a little bit about human evolution. I'm not going to go too far enough because I don't specialize in that, but I need to talk a little bit about it just so we can talk about how early humans might have affected this extinction event, then we'll talk about climate fluctuations throughout the end of the Pleistocene into the Holocene, as well as sea level fluctuations, just to set up our topics for the next video. Because in the next video, the Anthropocene, we talk a lot about climate. So let's get started. So starting in the Pleistocene, which went from 2.6 million years ago to around 12,000 years ago. During this time, Earth was going through cyclic periods of glacial and interglacial cycles. And for the most part, throughout the entire Pleistocene, glaciers covered most of the northern hemisphere continents. And so it was still a very cold time, even in interglacial periods. And we can see on this graph to the right that these cycles were pretty consistent. And what we think is that they were related to the Milankovitch cycles, aka Earth's eccentricity, tilt, wobble. So all of these astronomical factors coming into play and affect the glacial cycles on Earth probably due to the distance Earth was from the sun at certain periods of time in its orbit and all of that. So that could have had something to do with it, but I want to stress that this matching up with the Milankovitch cycles and the glacial cycles is not fully understood. So if it's something you want to look into, it is really interesting research and is important for studying climate. But regarding moving into the Holocene, we see that the last glacial period, or what we call the last glacial maximum, was around around 22,000 years ago, and temperatures began to rise after that around 15,000 years ago. And as these glaciers retreated around 15,000 years ago, sea level rose because ice melting means more water, and that water has to go somewhere. And so as glaciers melt, the sea level rises. And we'll talk a lot more about how much the sea level rose at the end of the lecture when we get to the sea level change from the Pleistocene to the Holocene, which was insane. But another thing these retreating glaciers caused was the Great Lakes. They formed and filled the Great Lakes as they retreated and melted back. And we can see that in this bottom right picture over here. And we can still see quite a glacial landscape when we look at certain areas of Minnesota, the Dakotas, and southern Canada as those glaciers left behind what's called prairie potholes. And these potholes can be small ponds or marshes that have actually over the years allowed many species of waterfowl to stop and take a breather during their seasonal migrations. So it's pretty cool what these pothole landscape can mean for those kinds of species. But migrating birds aren't the only types of species that this glacial retreat heavily affected. We have evidence from fossils, especially fossil pollen, that reveals that certain types of trees, like deciduous trees, migrated northward as the glaciers retreated because they're that kind of environment they liked was retreating northward. And what's actually interesting about this is that we used to think that these types of similar plants and similar trees and forests and just communities of certain plants that typically like to be together in modern day earth, we used to think that they migrated together.
together. They evolved together. They pretty much did everything together because they, you know, somewhat rely on each other. It seems they do in modern day. But what actually happened is that this migration of deciduous trees, as well as other types of trees in these different forest environments that were around then, migrated at different rates. And something pretty cool is that this migration map down here to the bottom right shows that as these glaciers retreated, the forest or color-coded clumps retreated as well. But this brown clump is kind of cool because this has no modern analog. So this environment south of the glaciers around 12,000 years ago would have been an evergreen forest unlike any forest that we see today. And so this type of plant community as well as the different combinations of plant communities we see as these migration rates differ was a really interesting finding in our fossil pollen evidence that we have. And this changed our opinions about how plant communities evolve. They evolve kind of independent of one another rather than dependent on one another. Getting right into the Younger Dryas now, so getting a little bit into the Holocene, the Younger Dryas is a cool period that occurred around 12,900 to around 11,700 years years ago. And as we can see from our geologic time scale, the Holocene began around 12,000 years ago. So this is getting right in to the beginning of the Holocene, which is the title of this video. So finally getting to what we came here for. So what happened is that after the LGM, the last glacial maximum around 22,000 years ago, started cooling around 15,000 years ago, that glacial retreat began. And then a sudden reversal of the warming climate conditions that caused the initial retreat of of those glaciers sent Earth back into a cooling regime. And this was around 12 to 13,000 years ago. And this was the Younger Dryas. Also, the reason the Younger Dryas is named Younger Dryas is because a lot of the evidence that we have for this glacial period comes from pollen from the flower genus Dryas. And that's why it's named that. Also, we have oxygen isotope evidence from forams because those are always really robust paleo temperature proxies. And so I have this little picture here of forams. But this is kind of a little animation of what the Younger Dryas glacial period kind of sort of looked like. And why did it happen is a whole nother question. It was a little weird to us that the warming conditions just abruptly switched back into cooling conditions. So people have looked into this and what we think is possible that might have happened is, for example, we have ocean circulation today that circulates cold and warm water around the entire ocean as a way to kind of keep the oceans <laughs> well circulated. Um, but what we think might have happened around 12,000 years ago is that you had an obstruction of flow from warm saline waters going to the Atlantic Ocean due to a freshwater influx from the melting glaciers that kind of blocked off the warm water pathway to the northern Atlantic. So what is thought is that that obstruction of warm flow to that part of the ocean caused more glaciation to occur up here where it already you know, was retreating from and it got cold again, the water got cold again, started to freeze again. And then it started, instead of retreating, it started progressing back south to cover again, more of the Northern Hemisphere continents. And so that could have helped cause the reversal. Another thought though, is that a comet or a bunch of comets may have impacted Earth around this 12,000 to 13,000 year ago period. And that could have sent Earth back to that cooling regime. So, so let's look at some of the evidence for this common impact before you take my word for it. So what we see is that right at this time interval in the rock record, we do see a dark layer of sediment that contains pretty much everything over here in terms of extraterrestrial material evidence. These include nano diamonds, which when formed at the surface of Earth, indicate high temperature and pressure associated with impact temperature and pressure, and then also charcoal and soot from from major wildfires that the comet impacts would have caused, then glassy carbon and low density carbon spherules. And these would have also been formed due to the wildfires. And then we also have helium evidence because we took helium isotope ratios of the sediment at this time interval. And it shows a extraterrestrial isotope composition, basically more helium three than four, which is not a common ratio on earth. We also have heavy metal evidence in which heavy metals are at high concentrations in some of the sediment at this layer, such as platinum, which is too rare on Earth to have gotten to the levels that we see it at during this time interval in the rock record. And we have glassy mica.
microspherules. So similar to the carbon spherules, but there are silicates and oxide spherules, and these indicate rapid cooling of droplets from molten rocks. And we see these types of things at other impact sites as well and other times in the rock record. That's why we associate them with impacts. Also, melt glass that is actually similar to a mineral called trinitite. And trinitite, by the way, is just a mineral that formed during an atomic bomb test that we did that basically sent material from the surface of the earth up into the air, melted it, it recooled and crystallized in the air, and then came back down and was this type of mineral called trinitite because of its new like mineral structure due to the high temp and high pressure and everything that was going on at that atomic bomb site. But an impact also could cause this high temp and high pressure that forms this type of mineral. So we saw those types of minerals. And these are the seven main pieces of evidence that we have that fragments of a comet may have really impacted Earth during this time, causing not only devastation where they impacted, but also wildfires that could have spread like wildfire um, around the areas where they impacted and caused a lot of devastation that way. And what I mean by devastation is that there was an extinction during this time, which is why everybody jumps to impact hypothesis. So let's go through this animal list and then we'll talk about how they went extinct and what the hypotheses are there. Because there's one more hypothesis that I haven't discussed that is probably the most likely one. But anyway, in terms of who all went extinct, around 14,000 to 12,800 years ago, we have huge beavers that would have been about the size of a black pear. Don't ask me why they went crazy and got that big, but they did. And mammoths and mastodons, saber-toothed cats, five different species of horses, short-faced bears, which as you can see, were huge. Um, North American camels, yes, we had those. And yes, they were actually really huge. Um, they're this camel on the back here. These are the camels we have today. So they were insanely big. Giant armadillos, um, I don't even have words for how big that armadillo is, but <laughs> then we also have the dire wolf that also went extinct. And this guy was pretty big, but not too much bigger than the gray wolf that we have today. And then we have the giant ground sloth, which I don't have scale there, but you could easily Google a picture. They were much, much bigger than today's sloth. And then for other victims that aren't actually shown here just because of lack of space, these include a large species of bison that had horns that spread over two meters, three members of the deer family, two species of wild oxen, a few species of lions and cheetahs, all three species of American elephants, and several species of birds of prey. So now the question is, why extinction? To answer this question, scientists have come up with a couple different hypotheses. The carnivores and birds of prey, we can somewhat explain away because carnivores hunt on many of the large herbivores that went extinct, and if their food source went extinct, then they go extinct. Similarly, birds of prey scavenge on these types of animals and could have also gone extinct for the same reasons. However, why did the large herbivores start to go extinct in the first place? Two hypotheses have been proposed. These include human hunting and the abrupt climate change that was the Younger Dryas cooling event. So we'll talk about the human hunting hypothesis and the evidence that we have for that first. But before we get to the human hunting hypothesis, I need to go back a couple steps and discuss a little bit about human evolution, which occurred during the Quaternary, just to get us all situated with, okay, what types of humans were around? Were they Homo sapiens? Were they Homo habilis, Homo erectus? What was going on? Who were these people? When did humans evolve? Let's answer those questions now. So what we know is that around 2.4 million years ago, Homo, the genus that we belong to, evolved from Australopithecus in Africa. Australopithecus was actually the first fully bipedal hominid, and hominids are just our family, and there's plenty more hominids out there, um, but Australopithecus is our closest relative that we likely evolved from, and the picture down here shows skeletons of a chimpanzee, our closest modern relative genetically, but obviously we didn't evolve from them, we just evolved from something similar millions and millions of years ago, and have had many transitional species since, and so this is modern relative. But in terms of ancient relatives, we have Australopithecus shown in both of these two skeletons in the middle. Then we have Homo sapiens shown here. But obviously, this jump was not made from Australopithecus to Homo sapiens. What actually happened is that Australopithecus jumped into making other Homo species first, and then other Homo species again, and 
then other homo species again, and then finally homo sapiens from those many transitional homo species. One early homo species is called Homo erectus, which migrated out of Africa around 1.9 million years ago, and as we see here, settled in East Asia around 0.9 million years ago, and Neanderthals, which can be seen over here much more recent than the Homo erectus species, are over here. These are also in the Homo genus, so Neanderthals are shown here. What we see is that these proliferated in Eurasia because they could hunt large Ice Age animals over there and thrived over there from 530,000 to 30,000 years ago. Then Homo sapiens evolved in Africa around 150 years ago. And then we can see that we quickly spread over everywhere in the world almost. And something I want to point out here is that it is known that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals did coexist for a little bit and may have also mated with one another. And there are studies that say we actually contain some Neanderthal DNA, which is pretty, pretty cool. But anyway, I'm not obviously an expert in that, so I just wanted to show this and kind of say, okay, this is where we're at. Yes, Homo sapiens were around by 150,000 years ago. Therefore, Homo sapiens, our own species, was for sure around by the time of the Younger Dryas and by the time of this extinction event and could have been responsible for causing the extinction event that we see around this time. So what is the evidence that we see for the human hunting hypothesis regarding the reason these large herbivores went extinct during this time? Well, we have a list here of possible evidence for the hunting hypothesis. What we know is that shortly after Clovis people or Clovis hunters, a group of people that hunted in this area during this time, uh, invaded North America, the large mammals went extinct. So there's a temporal relationship there that says, okay, well, we invaded this area and then they went extinct. Does that mean we're the blame? Also, we know that these large herbivores were probably easy targets for these early Clovis people because, well, they hadn't really seen people before and they probably weren't that afraid of them and then we could just take them down and eat their meat. And then similar extinctions of large mammals on other continents after man arrived at different times in the Pleistocene did occur. So there are other instances where we see extinctions of large mammals because of arrival of man. And then large mammals and birds were affected most, so that could be because humans were eating and hunting birds and large mammals. Also, extinct animals weren't replaced, so it wasn't just, oh, these things are evolving into something different, or there was an extinction due to climate change, and then certain things survived and adapted. It was just, they died, and they weren't replaced by anything similar or a certain species that had survived and diversified after the fact. So that's one thing. Also, extinctions were sudden, but we're going to see how this could also work in the favor of the climate hypothesis on the next slide. And then lastly, the reason that people oppose the climate hypothesis and lean toward the hunting hypothesis is because these mammals had survived through other sudden climatic shifts and cooling trends throughout the Pleistocene. So why was this one different? Why would they have died during this specific cooling trend? So before I move on to our evidence for the climate hypothesis, I do want to just show this is a really cool graph over here to the right. We have pink colored animals, purple colored animals, and brown colored animals shown on this map. The pink means probably human caused extinctions. The purple in the case of this rhino over here also has some pink legs. So humans a little bit, but mostly climate caused extinctions. Then we have pink down here in Australia, humans again. Then we have brown with the large armadillos and deer species in Africa and South America shown as insufficient data. So obviously those two examples are insufficient data, but over here in North America, we have all these green dots. The green dots indicate robust evidence. So this was likely human caused extinctions over here in North America. And then over here we have green, but also some yellow dots means provisional evidence, some robust evidence. And then down here in Australia, we have robust evidence. So that was likely human caused extinctions. And then obviously in South America and Africa, we have brown, which means needs more work.
work. So generally there's evidence for both, but in certain areas there's robust evidence for just humans or robust evidence for just climate. So what is the evidence for the climate? Well, here we can see a graph where we see the Younger Dryas drop in temperature, that sudden cooling trend, and the abruptness of this change could have played a role in causing animals to go extinct, but also the timing of the extinctions just coincide with the Younger Dryas. So again, there's temporal relationships there. Also, there's evidence for a local drier climate in the Holocene than in the Pleistocene. So the Pleistocene cooling events may have had a different overall climate other than just the cold temperature that remained sufficient to keep those mammals alive, whereas the Holocene cooling event was too dry and caused more extinctions, possibly. Also, it does mention that this drier climate would have affected big herbivores at the time, and the onset of the Younger Dryas was more abrupt than other glacial periods in the Pleistocene, which is what I showed here. But then we get to the comet impact. This is where the real evidence comes into play. If there was comet impacts, as we showed before, they would have caused devastating wildfires and just widespread environmental devastation, as well as an unhealthy atmosphere, unhealthy living environment, everything, and that would not be good for large mammals of any kind. So this comet impact hypothesis may work for certain regions on the globe, but obviously wouldn't explain all of the mass extinctions throughout the globe that were going on at this time. So maybe it was some man in certain continents and then some climate in others. But the last piece of evidence for the climate hypothesis, and mainly just for the not hunting hypothesis, is that the Clovis culture, or the Clovis people, and the large mammals disappeared around the same time. So how can we say that the Clovis people were to blame for causing these large mammals to go extinct when they were also going extinct at the same time? So that is kind of controversial evidence. There's evidence that in certain places, humans and mankind were thriving, and then there's some evidence for certain places where they were dying. And so maybe this comes back to the common impact hypothesis where certain areas were getting impacted, and that was where both large mammals and man were going extinct at the same time, whereas in other places, man were hunting the large mammals to extinction. So it's up in the air. It's probably a little bit of both. That's the conclusion there. Okay, so now we're moving to the last portion of this lecture where we're going to talk about climate throughout the Pleistocene Holocene and then sea level change throughout the Pleistocene Holocene. So what we have shown here is general temperature fluctuations throughout Earth's history from 500 million years ago to present day now. And we can see the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum peak up here, but that is quite a few million years ago. And the Pleistocene doesn't actually start until 2.6 million years ago. So right around here. And what we see in the Pleistocene is that like we showed earlier, we get into these glacial interglacial cycles shown here that were related to the Milankovitch cycles. Remember at the beginning of the lecture. And then we move into the last glacial maximum, this big dip right here that slowly started coming out of that cooling regime into a more warming regime and then boop, dropped right back down in the Younger Dryas period due to a possible comet impact, still don't know. And then we come out of it as we warm back up to the generally consistent temperatures that we see from around 10,000 years ago to now. So now we're going to focus on just the Holocene and talk a little bit about those climatic fluctuations. But before we talk about the Holocene climate fluctuations, you're probably wondering, wait, isn't there something called global warming? Like, where is the peak that I'm supposed to see at just before time zero? I see a pretty straight line of this blue consistent temperature fluctuations right around where I'm supposed to see a spike, right? Well, it's there. Let's just zoom in a tiny bit. Okay, so here we go. This is actually that spike. What you're actually looking at when we look at this graph is something that goes back to 500 million years ago. So something that started like less than 100 years ago, it's going to be real squished. So we can see it. It is there. It's this little tick right here. And the reason it is so squished is because this warming regime that is occurring, and that's what we call climate change or global warming, today is actually happening at a rate faster than has ever happened throughout Earth's history, which is why it's such a squished peak. And the projections for 2050 and 2100 are shown up here quite a bit higher than where we're at, so that's concerning. But we're going to talk about all of that in the next lecture when I talk about the Anthropocene. So come back for that
that video and we'll talk about that peak. But I just wanted to show you that it is there. It just looks like it isn't there because it's tiny and really squished. So moving to the Holocene climate fluctuations, we have what's called the hypsothermal interval of warmth or hypsothermal interval of warmth that occurred around 9,000 to 6,000 years ago. This interval of warmth started right after the Younger Dryas and during this onset of the warm period, we have evidence that humans began living in houses rather than just caves. They were building themselves houses and then they were also starting to practice agriculture instead of just hunting and this was likely because they couldn't start practicing agriculture until there was agriculturally favorable land to actually agriculture on. And so they did that after the glaciers went away during this warm period after the Younger Dryas and they were able to do this and thrived and obviously, you know, we exist today. So <laughs> it worked. And the reason I have the tree rings and ice core shown here is because what we can also do is track the movement of continental glaciers through time using moraines. We can also track the movement of tree lines shown at the bottom right here through time using radiocarbon dating of stumps in mountainous regions. And we can also use tree rings to track climate change as well. And what we actually see with tree line and glacial and ice core evidence is that glacial movement and tree line movement paralleled one another really well throughout the fluctuations during the Holocene, which reflects similar climate change fluctuations. So we'll show a graph here where you can see these agreements between these different lines of evidence in a couple slides. And in terms of tree rings, you're probably wondering, well, how far in the past can we track? Well, we've been able to use trees as old as 4,600 years to track temperature and moisture conditions that far back in time. So well into the mid Holocene time. And like I mentioned, these three lines of evidence, the glacial record, the tree ring record, and the tree line record all show remarkable agreement as seen here. Well, what I have here is tree ring fluctuations in thickness because tree rings will be thicker in favorable temperatures and thinner in colder, not so favorable temperatures and moisture conditions. Whereas the right graph shows a Greenland ice core temperature record back to 10,000 years. So these aren't on the same vertical or horizontal axes. So they look a little different in terms of length across because this one only goes back to 5,500 years. This one goes back to 10,000 years. And they look a little bit different in terms of vertical exaggeration because this one's on a more extended vertical scale than the tree ring one is. So that's why they look a little different, but I'm going to point out where the peaks are agreeing at the same time intervals as each of these lines of evidence, just to show you how well they agree with each other. Starting from the oldest peaks first, we have around 4,700 years ago, this major peak or uptick in temperature, or in the case of tree rings thickness shown in both graphs, this arrow at around 4,700 years ago. Then we also have this peak shown here in the tree graph and labeled here in the ice core graph as the Minoan warming period right around 33 to 3,400 years ago. And the peak on the tree ring graph is at the same exact time. We also see a dip or a cooling period around 25 to 2,600 years ago on the tree ring graph. And then we see this same dip right at the same time in the ice core graph. We also see the Roman warming in the tree ring graph at around 1900 to 2000 years ago. Then we see the Roman warming peak at the exact same time in the ice core graph. Then we see this dip in temperature or in the case of tree rings thickness shown right around 1100 years ago. And it's shown at the exact same time interval in the ice core graph. Then we see the peak of the medieval warm period labeled on both graphs at the exact same time around 900 years ago. Then we see another dip or cooling period called the Little Ice Age shown in the exact same time on both graphs. Then we see this last little uptick that is shown for both graphs right around time zero really, which is what we call global warming. And this agreement between records of paleo temperature proxies is not not only seen in ice cores and tree rings, we can also use
issues, isotope ratios in fossils, elemental composition and elemental ratios in fossils, and the tree line record like we talked about, and radiocarbon dating of fossils. There's a lot of different things that we can use to make these records really robust. And obviously with just two examples, we can already see wonderful agreement. So here I mentioned, which I just mentioned already, that fossils and fossilized pollen also help to reconstruct ancient temperature and moisture conditions, aka paleoclimate on Earth. Also, these paleo indicators suggest that there was much drier conditions in Western North America during the most recent warm period, aka the medieval warm period around 900 years ago. And these dry conditions in Western North America during during this warm period act as a warning. The reason that we want to study paleoclimate and reconstruct these temperature fluctuations through time on Earth and throughout Earth's history is to know how they might affect the regions that we live in and rely on today because, you know, we're already going through water shortage in Western North America and other places on Earth. And if it becomes dry again like it did during this warm period, that serves as a warning to us of what we need to do to either prepare for or try and and combat and reverse climate change so that we can continue to take advantage of the land that we use and that we live on and not have a mass extinction. So next, I want to talk a little bit about sea level fluctuation through the Holocene. So what we have right at the Pleistocene to Holocene transition is a rapid rise in sea level of around 120 meters. I'm going to say that again, 120 meters. What? That is insane. We can see that in this graph right here, right after the LGM. And obviously, you know why. It's because of the glacial retreat after the LGM. The reason the sea level rose so much is because those glaciers were melting and melting glaciers we know cause water to go into the ocean and the ocean rises because there's just a lot of water. And it kind of did taper off to this more slower and gentler sea level rise rate up here shown in this graph ever since around six to 7,000 years ago. So yes, it has gradually slowed down throughout the Holocene and now we're at a pretty constant level, but it is rising again, it's not at the same rate as it was rising during the glacial retreat after the LGM, but it could likely spike again in a similar fashion if we kick into gear the positive feedback associated with glaciers and ice sheets melting. And that positive feedback is another thing I talk a lot more about in the next video. So make sure and check that out so we can all learn a little bit about why ice melting could cause some crazy sea level rise ramifications and warming ramifications that we probably don't want to deal with. And before I let you go, if you're still watching this video, I'd love it if you'd comment down below your favorite animal or organism species that has lived during the Holocene. My personal favorite is the giant armadillo that went extinct with a lot of the other mammals during the megafauna extinctions. And I just think that it's such a cool, huge piece of animal. I mean, come on. How cool would it be to see one of those guys? So anyway, comment that down below. I'm super curious to know your favorite. And with that, thank you guys so much for watching this video. And I can't wait to see you guys next time. Bye. 12,800 million? Man. As these glacials, glacials, can we just appreciate the fact that I got the lines of evidence to match in color coordination on both of the hypotheses? I mean, come on, man. It's so beautiful. Like, what? Okay, anyway, that's my OCD of these color coordinated slides coming together, but <laughs> let's move on. That would have been bad. Oh, wait, no.